All right, so where do we start here? First, double check that it's balanced in case we got one of those weird acid base reactions that's not one to one. But then what? Put everything in moles. So if we've got grams of a solid, getting that to moles, something we should be able to do in our sleep now, right? In fact, I was, I was amazed. This is maybe the first time this has ever happened. The class average on the mass to mass stoichiometry problem on the midterm was higher than the one where all you had to do was go from moles to moles to figure out the limiting reactant. Both of them, the median was was 10 out of 10, but the the um, Q1 was a little bit lower on the simpler problem. So I think everybody re overthought the one where I gave you moles to moles. You didn't need to do anything involving molecular weight for that one. So with that in mind, everybody's pretty good at doing molecular weight calculations at this point. So let's use that. 0 0.395 grams and 0.395 grams of sodium hydroxide. And it's what, 39.998-ish? Something really close to 40. Sweet. My memory is not totally gone yet. So then we're going to get something just under 0 0.01. What do we get? 8.8. Eight, eight. Perfect. Occasionally, questions. I make the numbers really easy for myself. And then how about 115 milliliters at a known molarity? Well, 115 milliliters. We know how to do this, right? And for every 10 to the three milliliters, it's 0 0.0955 moles of our perchloric acid. Point zero one something. Thank you. So what's going to run out first? The hydroxide, right? Sodium hydroxide. We have less of it. It's one to one. On the problem that we ended with the other day, where it was not one to one, yes, I did say we'd go over that one before we uh, we got going today. So I should use that for our our practice here. We'll talk about that one in a second then. So something that I noticed is I think I've been skipping too many steps when it comes to these one to one reactions. We can't really just subtract this number from this number if they're not the moles of the same substance, right? So if it's one-to-one -one ratio that they're being used, then mathematically, it looks like we're just multiplying by one. The number doesn't change. But I think that me skipping that step threw off some people that were struggling with that two, how do you do the two-to-one ratio problem? So if we want to actually subtract these two numbers, if we want to know how much is left, we actually need to take 0 0.00988 moles of hydroxide. And we should show that step. We say, okay, for every one mole of NaOH, that's one mole of perchloric acid used.
then it makes it really explicitly clear why we're allowed to do the subtraction. Because normally we can't just subtract moles of one thing from moles of something else, right? We want to add moles or subtract moles of something. It's got to be moles of the same substance. So we weren't showing our work fully when we were just doing the subtract this moles from the other because um, I was just trying to save space and mathematically it doesn't change anything, right? But from a logic standpoint, it does. So if we started with 0 0.0110 moles per chloric acid, then we're using 0, 0, 0.0988. Get what? 0, 0, it's 11 minus. 9.9. .9. So, what is that? 1. Point, point zero zero one one. Sorry? 112. One, one, Except, how many decimal places do we get to keep? That's for multiplication and division, right? For subtraction, it's the least number of decimal places. So that's why we're gonna round this off. You said the right thing, but I wanted to emphasize it's not the least number of sig figs. Ethan? I got zero, zero, one. I think one one because before you do the subtraction, you could you would you could round this to point zero zero nine nine. And then when you do the subtraction, you get one one. I think you just you didn't round up, you you just dropped off the second eight, right? Yeah. We want to round this one up. That gives us moles left. So final part of this question is we need to find what is the pH. We kind of skipped the pH of the solution before the NaOH. We'll get to that in a second. If we have 0 0.0011 moles left and we want to find the pH after the reaction, we need concentration after the reaction, right? Because pH is negative log of molarity of hydronium, H3O plus. And with a strong acid solution, we can say that our concentration of hydronium is the same as our concentration of our acid. So for now, I'm only giving you strong acids. So we're just going to treat your concentration of acids, concentration of acid, like it's the same as your concentration of H3O plus. Right? If it's a weak acid, which is frankly most of them, are weak acids. You know how to name weak acids, but strong acids, 100% of the time when you put them in water, will turn into H3O plus and an anion floating around by itself. That's sort of a definition of strong acid. So all of the pH questions that I'm asking you at this point are all strong acids. So we can assume these two concentrations are the same. So after the reaction, how do we get concentration? Molarity is over liters, right? So 0 0.0011 moles left over 0.115 liters. That's just 100. 115 milliliters divided by 1,000. What do we get for our... What do we get for a final concentration before we take the log of it? All right, so 
mental arithmetic and estimating doing your reasonableness check gets a little bit trickier when we're doing logs, right? But so that's this should just be 0 0.0011 divided by 0.115. And that looks about right to me. So what should, before you hit enter on your calculator, what should the pH be close to? Yeah, if you round to the nearest decimal, the nearest whole decimal value, nearest power of 10, be the best way to play, put it. This is really close to 0 0.01, right? And if it was, if it was exactly 0 0.01, our pH would be two on the nose. So when we take negative log of this number, we should get something really close to two, a little bit more than two, right? Within sig figs, it's 2.0, except we always go to the hundredths place. So to the hundredths place, it's 2.00, 2.02. So remember with these logs, we're not, we have a different sig fig system. So we're just gonna say for once you take the log of something, always go to the hundredths place. Does it have units anymore? Two, yeah, it's just pH units. It doesn't really have units. Once you take the log, of something with units, we basically, the units go away. Um, in theory, to do that, you should have these, these molarities, which, or this molarity should cancel out with something else, but this is just part of our definition. When you take, when you use this P operator, it gets rid of whatever units you have and just leaves you with pH units. I skipped over the easy part of this problem. What's the pH of the solution before the hydroxide is added? You don't even have to do any math because you're given the starting concentration of perchloric acid, right? You're given the starting concentration. It doesn't even matter how many moles you have. All that matters, you just take the negative log of the concentration that you're given, which is going to be really close to what? 1.02. Our concentration changed by a factor of 10, right? We went from 0 0.0955 to 0 0.0096. If your pH, if your concentration changes by a factor of 10, that's one pH unit because it's a log base scale. So our pH initially was just 1.02. We added enough hydroxide to use up almost all of our perchloric acid, but we had a little bit of perchloric acid left. So the pH changed by one pH unit. All right, how are we feeling about pH? Um, and then if you're, like, for something you have to calculate, like, the oxide. So you could start from pOH, but you're going to want, you always, I'm never going to ask you a question that says, what's the pOH of the solution? I guess I shouldn't say never. I probably do at some point. Um, but usually the more standard way of, of finishing this problem is turning that into pH. 14 minus pOH. Philip? Um, this week's Canvas quiz is actually set up um, to be gas laws at this point, um, which is what we're covering today. Um, but there's a there's some practice problems at the end of the slides from from Monday, um, if you're if you want to practice, if you're trying to avoid pH problems and you're just hoping it doesn't show up on a quiz, then you're in luck for now. All right.
how did the rest of the problem go where it was the calcium hydroxide, where it was the two to one ratio? One we ended with on Wednesday. It wasn't one to one. This one, this one, you still had excess acid at the end, right? Or was it excess hydroxide? Okay. Let's, uh, just for fun, just so that you can't possibly miss any points on a pH problem in the future. Let's do it again with different numbers. Let's do it at, let's say I have 0 0.750 liters at, Zero point zero. We'll still keep two zero. And point eight two eight grams of calcium hydroxide. So they were really close to being used up evenly before, right? So I just tweaked it, gave it a little bit more on the hydroxide side. That way we could practice doing pOH as well. So what was the molecular weight for calcium hydroxide? Close to 100. Is it that one? What's the molecular weight? So 17 and 17 is 34 plus calcium, which is 40. So no, something about close to 74. Thank you. So we'll get something a little bit more than 0.01, right? Let's call it three sig figs. All right, and here we get 0 0.0150. Oh. Moles. All right, so we're trying to find concentration of the excess reactant, right? Again, it's two to one ratio, not one to one. So just because we have fewer moles of calcium hydroxide, but the HI is being used up twice as fast. We don't have twice as much HI. So we should run out of the acid first. So good. When I made up numbers, I did skew them far enough. Philip? Oh, okay. So now if we're pretty sure we're going to run out of acid first, Let's figure out how much calcium hydroxide is going to get used up. So if we have a point, what was that? So, sorry, yeah. Yeah, let's figure out how much gets used up in order to figure out how much is left over. We need to know what's used in order to know how much excess we have. 
So if we use up all of our HI, and for every two moles of HI, that's one mole of calcium hydroxide used. Just cut it in half, right? Calcium hydroxide used. Now we're in a position where we can subtract it, right? Because now we have moles of calcium hydroxide used and moles of calcium hydroxide we started with. Everybody with me? So even if it's one-to-one, -one, so as to not confuse yourself, it can be helpful to show that one-to-one -one conversion, that stoichiometry step, because that reminds you to do that when it's not one-to-one -one as well. Right? Even though mathematically you don't really need to show that if everything's one-to-one, -one, it's not a bad idea. So 0 0.0112 moles of calcium hydroxide to start. Minus 0 0.00750 moles used. Three seven. Yeah. How many sig figs do we get, to, or where do we take the decimal points out to? The ten thousandths, right? We have, dis we have digits out to four decimal places here, five decimal places here, so we get to keep four decimal places. Moles of calcium hydroxide left. We're trying to get to pH. What's the next thing we need to do? Close. We're going to want to take the negative log. We're going to want to get to pOH, right? pOH is negative log of hydroxide concentration, specifically the hydroxide ions. So first off, we could start by turning our moles of calcium hydroxide left and putting that into molarity, right? So concentration of calcium hydroxide zero point zero zero three seven moles over 0 0.750 liters. Get something around point, what, point 0.48? Point, or sorry, point zero zero four eight. Is that enough to get POH? Exactly. Say that again louder, Joel. There's a reason that I wrote this specifically as concentration of calcium hydroxide left, but POH is negative log of hydroxide ion. What happens to calcium hydroxide when you dissolve it in water? What happens to those ions? They all split apart, right? 
So for every one mole of calcium hydroxide, we actually get two moles of hydroxide ions, right? So since we want concentration of hydroxide ions, we have to do one more quick stoichiometry step. Because forever three for every zero point or sorry, point zero zero three seven moles of calcium hydroxide. And for every one mole of uh, CaOH2, we get two moles of hydroxide ions when it's dissolved. So remember when we were talking about perchloric acid and I said, oh, you can just say that the concentration of hydronium is the same as the concentration of your acid, right? Not in the case of these hydroxides where you get more than one. It's a two to one ratio. Because there are two hydroxides for every one mole of calcium hydroxide. So then our concentration of hydroxide ions is going to be equal to 0 0.0074 divided by 0 0.0, or sorry, 0 0.750 0 liters. Get this. Keeping two sig figs, right? So this one is kind of the, the trickiest of pH questions I can ask you. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's got left over hydroxide, so you have to go pOH instead of pH. And the hydroxide is two to one. So we actually wind up with a little bit of X. We wind up with this extra step here. This is as complicated as it's possible for me to write one of these questions. All right, so most of them are not going to be this tricky. So once again, we should get something really close to two for POH, right? 2.00. That's our POH. But since all of these questions always refer to pH of a solution, not POH of a solution, we just have to do one last step, which is subtract it from 14 because pH plus POH equals 14, which is actually on your equation sheet as well. You might not have known what to do with it yet because we hadn't covered this stuff yet, but we can get pOH, we can get pH. All right, so I'm not likely to ask you about to write one that's this tricky on, on the test. Quiz, maybe, and homework assignment, maybe, but not when you have time pressure. I'm not going to make you take all of these factors into consideration. All right, I might ask you one that's, not, that's a two-to-one ratio, but it'll probably have acid as the excess reagent, in which case... You don't need to worry about this extra two to one step, that stoichiometry step when it comes to the hydroxide concentration.
One last thing before we leave pH. We won't make this one a full-on stoichiometry problem. If you have a solution where the concentration of sulfuric acid is given, let's say it's point zero 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 molar, what's the pH? I guess what's the concentrate the hydronium concentration? You would think so, based on the example we just did, right? However, acids behave differently than the hydroxides. Use those protons sequentially. And the first one might dissociate 100% of the time, but the second one won't. The sec it'll lose the second proton less than 1% of the time. So... Effectively, for all of the acids, all of the strong acids, and I'll write out a list of the strong acids, but that's going to be most of the pH, all the pH questions that I ask you for, from now right now. Um, we basically treat it like it's only the first proton, this is strong proton that dissociates 100%. So for all the strong acids, we can just say if the concentration of the strong acid is 0 0.001, the concentration of hydronium is 0 0.001. So pH is three. It's only with the hydroxides, the strong bases, that where you where you wind up with that two to one ratio throwing things for a loop. For the strong acids, we just say that these two numbers are the same. Concentration of hydronium is equal to your concentration of the strong acid. All right, and just so you've seen this list before, there's there are seven strong acids. Has anybody heard the term strong acid before? Does anybody know the list? Does anybody want to throw some guesses out what's on the list? HCl. Hydrochloric, hydrobromic. Hydro what? Sulfuric, yep, because I just used that as an example, right? Um, I believe sulfuric is the only one that has more than one proton. So sulfuric is the only one where this winds up being an issue. Good guess based on hydrochloric hydrobromic, but it goes the other way. Hydroiodic. What else have we used as an example? Perchloric, nitric. There's six, what am I missing, Tomes? Sulfuric, nitric, perchloric. Hydrofluoric. Hydrofluoric's weak. It's got a, it's it's one of the stronger weak ones. Um, phosphoric has three protons to give, but even that first one's not a strong. Doesn't dissociate one hundred percent. Um, maybe there's only six. Maybe I just made up the seventh one. Your Google's not loading. <laughs> Chloric is considered. Okay, so what would, what would chlor the formula for chloric be? HClO3. Okay. There are more than that. You can, but these are the common strong acids. Um, <laughs> even stuff like acetic acid, it's really common, is not necessarily, it doesn't matter how concentrated you make a weak acid it's still not a weak acid you can actually have a weak acid with with a more acidic ph 
than a strong acid. What makes a strong acid is the fact that when you put any one of these seven into water, 100% of the time, they lose that first proton. And a weak acid, no matter how concentrated you make it, is only going to give up a fraction of its protons. For weak acid, you, you really can't unless you either say that you're doing a titration, like we did with the acetic acid yesterday, um, in which case you can just say that it's equal to your concentration of hydroxide. Um, or we just have to have excess hydroxide so that we can use our pOH to get to pH. You don't have the tools yet to be able to calculate the pH of a weak acid solution because it's an equilibrium reaction and we haven't dealt with reactions that don't go all the way to completion yet. I'm really excited to, to do that because I haven't gotten to teach that quarter of the Gen Chem series in a long time. And I've missed teaching equilibrium. Equilibrium is one of my favorite topics to teach because you can, you can write really, really fun word problems with it. Um, but we're not there yet. All right, questions on pH before we move on. So in okay, yeah. So if we have pH of twelve point zero zero, right? So pH is defined as negative log of hydronium concentration. Exactly. So twelve equals negative log of H three O plus concentration. So to solve for that, we do 10, we move the negative sign over, and then we do 10 to the power of each side to cancel out the log. So 10 to the minus 12 equals hydronium concentration, which is really close to zero, right? It's not quite zero, but it's really close to zero. That would be better. That, yeah, yes, that would be molarity. Well, you've got you guys have seen as or uh, gases before. What if we just went into equilibrium real quick? Do a quick dip in something else, rather than do something you've seen before. Does that sound like more fun? And we'll change up with the quizzes this this weekend. Or do we want safety blanket gases and PV equals nRT? Interesting math. PV equals nRT. Raise your hand for PV equals nRT. Let's just jump into the deep end. All right. We'll do that again now that I've given you warning. Raise your hand if you want to jump in the deep end. Equilibrium. It's not really that much of a deep end. It's just some it's an interesting algebra trick that you get to do. Algebra, come on, guys. Versus doing PV equals NRT. I already titled my notes here. Okay, equilibrium. Okay. We're going to get to both of these anyway. It's just a matter of what order we do them in. But Equilibrium does make more sense, given that we're working with pH and talking about, well, the first one is, is a strong proton, but the second one isn't. Let's talk about why, to make that make a little bit more sense. So equilibrium is, is the idea that it can, any chemical reaction that can happen can happen both forward and backward. And we've been treating it like like when we, if we had a chemical reaction happening, it happens 100% of the way to make product, right? That's how we do our theoretical yield. That's the assumption that we've been making is we keep making product till we run out. 
But the thing is, is that if every reaction can happen both forward and backward, then that means that you're going to come to a point where the reverse reaction is happening at the same rate as the forward reaction. And if the reverse reaction is happening, so let's say we put acetic acid in water. Actually, let's start with a strong acid. We put hydrochloric acid in water. It's a strong acid. The water acts as the base, the HCl acts as the acid. What are our products gonna be? <clears throat> Just keep, you can keep that one on your page. We'll come back to that in a second. So for a strong acid, when you put it in water, this reaction happens and it happens within sig figs, it happens to completion. It happens 100% of the time. When you put HCl in water, you get hydronium and chloride. And since that's a one-to-one -one ratio, that's why we're allowed to say, well, our concentration of hydronium is the same as our concentration as the strong acid. If you put a weak acid in water, like we use acetic acid as our example, it still does the same reaction. You still get H3O plus, and instead of chloride, what do we get? Acetate. But it doesn't happen 100% of the time or more accurately, it happens backwards a significant portion of the time. When it reaches equilibrium, when the reverse reaction is happening at the same rate as the forward reaction, it's not 100% dissociated. So if it's an equilibrium reaction, if it's a reaction that doesn't happen to completion, we actually indicate that by being very picky about how we write our arrows out. If it goes to completion, we just use a regular reaction arrow. If it's an equilibrium reaction where it's not gonna go 100% of the way to, to your products, you write it an arrow going both directions. Not a single arrow, so don't do it like this. That means something different. That means you've got resonant structures and we're not, not dealing with resonant structures yet. So it's actually two arrows, one forward and one backward. So if this is the case, if it's an equilibrium reaction, there's actually, there's lists at the back of most chemistry textbooks full of what are called equilibrium constants. And the equilibrium constant is just, is essentially a way that we can calculate how much product are you going to make? Right, and so the um, the equal the definition of the equilibrium constant, which we represent with a capital K. This is this is my Fight Club reference from earlier. Is it's always going to be products over reactants. The first rule of equilibrium is products over reactants. The second rule of equilibrium is products over reactants. Right, so never forget that. And it's always concentrations. So a lot of times when we're just writing out generic form, we'd say that K is equal to the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. This means the point where this reaction happens forward the same rate it happens backwards has some constant ratio of products to reactants every reaction is going to have its own equilibrium constant. All right, so for for just some reaction, let's see if I can do one of these from memory. It may have mixed up with it, which of these. 
If you take uh, nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas and put them together, you can make ammonia. But it's an equilibrium process. And this reaction has an equilibrium constant. And that equilibrium constant is defined as products over reactants. So we would write that K for this reaction is equal to your concentration of your products to the coefficient, to the power of the coefficient. So this one, we made two ammonia molecules. So we'd say concentration of ammonia squared over concentration of nitrogen, which has a coefficient of one, so you can write to the one if you want, but you don't need to, since anything to the one is just the same value, right? Times concentration of hydrogen to the third. So it's always just products over reactants raised to their powers. And let me make sure that I'm not, that I don't have this one backwards. I'm pretty sure I remember. Process. So one divided by no twelve. All right. So the equilibrium process for this reaction has a value of one point nine five times ten to the minus three. So this means this reaction stops at a very predictable place when the ratio of products over reactants is equal to 0 0.00195. So, well, what does that get us? How do we actually get anything out of that? Right up here so I don't forget it. 1.95 E minus three. Well, if we want to find out how much product we're going to make from something, we need to figure out when we're going to hit that point where these concentrations are equal to this ratio, which is an interesting algebra problem. Because let's say we start with no ammonia and we start and, oh, let's just say it's at a three to one ratio, 1.00 and 3.00. So we don't need to worry about limiting reactants. If we wanna know how much ammonia we can make, We need to find our equilibrium concentrations of all three of these. NH3 squared over nitrogen times hydrogen to the third. This is a really interesting algebra problem. Because we know the reaction is going to happen a certain amount of times, right? If, a re if this reaction happens... For every one time this reaction happens, we're going to use up a certain amount of reactant and make a certain amount of product, right? Based on our stoichiometric ratios, our coefficients. So we're going to use a tool. And this, is, this tool is one of my favorite uh, algebra tricks. Um, and this is the reason that it's, it's a really common tool. Uh, it's called an ice table. 
ICE stands for initial change and end or equilibrium. And basically we're just gonna write the word ICE next to these. And our first row is exactly what it sounds like. We fill in the first row and we say, okay, write your initial concentrations of everything. C stands for change. We don't know what how much everything's going to change, but we know that all of the changes are going to be relative to each other, right? So what what could we if you're thinking in algebra terms, what could we do to use just one variable to represent all of the changes? What's that? Delta that is kind of what this whole row represents, yeah. But how could we do that with a variable, with one variable? We could do, we're gonna lose some amount of X and we're gonna lose some amount of, um, we're gonna lose X amount of nitrogen and Y amount of hydrogen and we're gonna make Z amount of ammonia. But then we have three variables, right? Systems equations with three variables are a pain. It's all one ratio, so we can just use X. So how are we gonna do this then? Instead of Y, what should I write? Three X. We can't just write X again because they're not being used up at the same ratio, but they are being used at a predictable ratio based on the balanced reaction, right? For our product, we're making product. So it's a plus and it's gonna be two X. So really what this is, this is a system of equations that we were able to just represent it in this as this table and write all of our equations with one variable right off the bat. So then at equilibrium, at the end of our reaction, how much nitrogen are we gonna have? If this is our initial and this is our change, at the end we have what? So change, change is our delta. This is how much it's changing. So basically you're just gonna add up each column of our table. At the end, we're gonna have 1.00 minus X for nitrogen. And hydrogen is gonna be what? 3.00 minus 3x. And how much, what do we get for ammonia? Just 2x. Cool. Now we know that at equilibrium, we know what all the concentrations are going to be ish. We have a variable still involved. But now we can take these and plug them into our products over reactants, which is gonna be a really, really nasty algebra equation to solve. But I'll show you a trick to deal with it. One, Wolfram Alpha is your friend for these. You will get some that you can't solve analytically. Um, there's a possibility, does anybody know, everybody knows the quadratic formula, right? Then there's the cubic version of the quadratic formula, right? And then there's the four to the fourth x to the fourth power version. Turns out there actually is, you can write a proof, an abstract algebra proof, showing that there is no equivalent to the quadratic formula for powers of x to the fourth or greater. Maybe it's x to the fifth or greater. I'd have to talk to the math teachers. But basically you'll wind up with stuff that you can't solve analytically. You can't solve algebraically. And even this one looks pretty nasty if we plugged it in. 1.95 times 10 to the three, that's our K value, right? Is equal to these concentrations is equal to two X squared over 1.00 minus X times 3.00 minus three X quantity cubed. 
solve that for X, no big deal, right? Calculator, Wolfram Alpha, use the solver. But effectively, once you can solve X for X, you can figure out what your final concentrations of everything are. Because once you know what X is, you can figure out what your final concentration of nitrogen by just doing one minus X. You can find your concentration of hydrogen by doing three minus three X. You can find your concentration of ammonia at equilibrium and you'll have measurable amounts of all three of them. All right. That's a really good to plug into Wolfram Alpha or to try and solve by hands. Not even particularly nice to enter in by hand. But I assume you can plug it in just for the sake of finishing this one up. And then we'll, I'll show you the trick to actually do it by hand easier, easy way. You got four different values. Because, but the thing is, if you get four different values for X, only one of them will make physical sense. If you get a negative value for X, that can't happen, right? And you can't have anything where X is greater than one, right? And you can't have anything where X involves an I value, an imaginary number. We only are interested in real numbers, right? So even if you get four answers for X, only one of them is valid. How do you know which one? Yeah. Because if you try plugging in the other three X's, the three X's, what are your three X values or your four X values? So we know it can't be a negative one. So, so there's, there's two positives. There's two positives. What are they? And? Which of those is the right X value? And how do you know? Because we can't have X be more than one or else we're saying we're using up nitrogen we don't have. If X is greater than one, well, that doesn't make physical sense. You got an algebraic answer saying, oh, you're gonna make 30 pizzas when you only have enough cheese to make 10. That, that answer doesn't make sense. So we can discount it. It solves this function, but it doesn't work in the real world. So we can just toss it out. If you get more than one X value, anytime you're doing one of these problems, if you get more than one X value, only one of them will make sense. The rest of them will be negative when they shouldn't be, or they'll be outside the range of how much you have from your initial reactants. Okay. All right. And so what I mean by plug this into Wolfram Alpha is you literally type this in and hit solve for X and let Wolfram Alpha do the, the mess for you. And then that number we get for X is the moles of the three cubes. That, that number for X is going to be what you plug in to get your final concentrations at equilibrium. Okay. All right. We want easier way to do this though, right? Like it's nice that we all have solvers. Can you imagine learning this for the very first time in the time before the internet and before calculators had solvers on them? Um, you, we couldn't solve this one. There's an assumption that we can make though in some conditions. So let's talk about one more time about, let's do an easy, an easy reaction first. So solubility is an equilibrium reaction. If you have a saturated solution, you have an equilibrium reaction happening. So let's say we'll go with one that's where K is really small. Let's say you put lead chloride in water, lead two chloride in water, and you make lead two ions aqueous and chlorides aqueous. If this reaction happens, 
in its equilibrium reaction, we can look up an equilibrium, a uh, K value for this. And 1.6, 10 to the minus five. All right. So here's the, the other, if we're talking about, about pure substances, can their concentrations ever change? The number of moles you have can change, but the concentrations are fixed, right? So for anything that's a pure substance, that's a liquid or a solid, basically it doesn't show up in our equilibrium expression. We basically get our equilibrium expression here. It's still products over reactants. So it's lead concentration okay. times chloride concentration squared over concentration of solid lead chloride. But that's a constant, right? If that's not changing, basically, Anything that has a constant concentration, we just leave off of our K expression. So that's the third rule of equilibrium. Third rule of equilibrium is solids and liquids don't count in your equilibrium expression. So right off the bat, this is looking like it's gonna be an easier problem to solve. So if we're trying to dissolve solid lead chloride in water, does it matter how much lead chloride we have to start with? No. So you just say not applicable. If we start with no lead and no chloride, What's our change going to be for both of them? It's going to be plus because they're both products, right? Plus X and plus 2X, right? So that means at equilibrium, we're just going to have X and 2X. This is looking like it's going to be a lot easier to solve, right? Or the, using the concentration of like solids and liquids don't count, is it that they just don't exist or that it just like one time? It's like, it's, it's like it's, it gets factored into the K value because it's a constant and it doesn't change no matter what. So let's say that if, if it was over a concentration of a, of a solid, the fact that that never changes means we can just take both, multiply both sides by that constant and it goes away and just becomes part, you get a constant times K, which okay, is just that, a different constant. Okay, that makes sense. It's not like canceling out or anything. It's you're multiplying to it. It's just a... Because it never changes, it doesn't factor in. We only concentrations that change factor in to our equilibrium expression. All right, so solving this now becomes a lot easier because we get 1.6 times 10 to the minus five equals X times two X squared. That's something we can all solve, right? We just get equals four X to the third. And then you can divide both sides by four, take the cube root, what do we get for X? four times 10 to the minus six. I can't really do cube roots in my head. You don't know where the cube root button is on your calculator. How can you get around that? You can do raised to the 
negative one third or raised to the one third, I mean. What do we get for X? Wait, what'd you get, Joel? Did you divide by four yes. before you took the cube root? And you got 0 0.015? Those are both close enough that I can't tell which one is the reasonable one in my head. So make sure you divide, take the cube root of four times 10 to the mi minus six, right? Or 0 0.0004. I, I get point. Oh, no, I've missed two zeros. That's why. Yeah, point zero, zero, five, eight, seven. Okay. So I divide by four because to solve for X, you need to divide both sides by four before you can take the cube root. So one, six. Yeah. All right, let's, we're not gonna start a new problem with four minutes left. So we'll talk about acetic acid on Monday. I'll change up the quiz so it's not gas laws related. It will be some pH practice, not equilibrium based though. Yeah. We're still gonna get to that stuff. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, so, so these two, this dissolves to make these, right? But then if these happen to run into each other when they're floating around in water, there's a chance that they could stick back together to make the solid again. Once you reach equilibrium, it takes time to reach equilibrium. You can't, you don't start with things going backwards because initially you don't have any product, right? So rates is different. Rates you have to use calculus because you can say that the change in concentration over the change in time is equal to certain so the probability that the right molecules bump into each other at the right time. It's it's not actually that bad, especially once you have calc one. It's it's calc one topics. If you if you have calc one, you deal a lot with taking the differential, taking the derivatives of of you know f of x, right? Df over dx. Um, this is basically just substituting concentration for for y and substituting time for x. But you can still take the integral and take the derivative of those functions. Not notice it because we're dealing with numbers that are so large. So normally, yes, we would expect it to be to be have some noise in it. But when we're dealing with a, with a mole of of reaction happening forward and backward at the same time. The fluctuation is going to be so small it's to be unnoticeable, unmeasurable. So within sig figs, nothing's happening. So it's what's called dynamic equilibrium. So think about how your bank account. If you take money that you, if you reach dynamic equilibrium, that would mean that from month to month your bank account's not changing. Money's coming out the same rate it's going in. It's not that you're not buying anything or not earning money, 
It's just that if you're measuring it on the scale of once every month, exactly, exactly. So if you zoom in far enough, you can be able to see that it's actually still very active. We're just not able to zoom in that far. I still don't. I don't see how to find.